डॉक्टर आर पी गुप्ता प्रेसिडेंट इंटरनेशनल कॉलेज ऑफ डेंटिस्ट इंडिया श्रीलंका इन दाल सेक्शन राइट इंडियन डेंटल एसोसिएशन चंडीगढ़ स्टेट ब्रांच एमिनेंट स्पीकर ऑफ द इवेंट डॉक्टर डॉक्टर रघुनाथ बतैया फेडर्स फ्रॉम आई सी डी इंटरनेशनल हेड ऑफिस मेंबर्स ऑफ द बोर्ड ऑफ रीजन ऑफ आई सी डी सेक्शन सिक्स एग्जेक्टिव कमेटी मेंबर्स ऑफ आई डी चंडीगढ़ स्टेट ब्रांच डियर आई सी डी मास्टर्स एंड फेलोज इंडियर कलीग्स फ्रॉम ऑल अक्रॉस वर्ल्ड फ्रेंड्स आई सी डी सेक्शन सिक्स इज फिफ्टी सेवन ईयर ओल्ड सेक्शन एंड इज एक्टिवली एंगेज इन कैरिंग आउट मेनी साइंटिफिक एंड कॉम्यूटी एक्टिविटीज Please visit our website www.icdsection6.com to know more about our section. I welcome you all to the third session of the certificate program on infection control and occupational safety in dental practice, being conducted by our fellow CPA Dr. Raghunath Pataiya from US, who is an authority on infection infectious diseases control in dentistry. Dr. Raghu has been sharing his enormous experience in this field. and he has been enlightening us in the previous two sessions there have been many take home points to enhance to our existing knowledge and subject the program is initiated by the icd international head office in collaboration with icd section 6 and id chandigarh branch i now i know you are all looking forward to hear dr raghu and without much delay i invite dr arpit gupta honorary secretary id chandigarh to take to take over the proceedings thank you dr chok uh, uh, for the kind introduction and uh, i would like to call upon uh, dr rp gupta the president of icd section 6 and ida chandigarh state branch uh, for his welcome remarks dr gupta please thank you dr rp it's my proud privilege and honor to welcome all my viewers who, who are from anywhere they are joining this session and my special welcome to our speaker dr ravu who is globally known on this subject and that is why we are having lot of the viewers lot of the we never expected that we have to open the youtube also i also welcome uh, if they have joined dr gaba k gaba he is the head of the oral health sciences department and our past president ida chandigarh state branch and dr ravinder singh a president head of his secretary dr ashok doble if they have joined my warm welcome to both of them if they are here i request them they can speak for a minute or so arpit they are there no uh, sir they are yet to join i believe so I to join. okay thank yeah. you i don't i don't want to waste the time arpit i am handing to you Okay. Now I would like to uh, call upon Professor Mahesh Verma, who is the chairman for CDE at uh, ICD Section Six and also the Vice Chancellor of IP University, to take the proceedings ahead. Professor Verma, please. Thank you, Arvind. Uh, as you all know, that uh, Dr. Raghu has been uh, extraordinary speaker. He's sharing his, uh, uh, you know, his uh, information with us, and not only that, he's, you know, building up the. subject subject matter in such a way that it is uh, uh, you know uh, it is percolating it is uh, being disseminated amongst all and uh, i just would like to recap a little bit that uh, we had the first session on 23rd of may and uh, there we talked about what is the rationale for the infectious diseases a uh, little bit about uh, roots of transmission how the modern Uh, infection control guidelines came up and uh, what are the precautions to, to be taken during epidemic and during non epidemic times and uh, also we need to practice standards with knowledge not just mimic it not that somebody is saying that we are doing it and we also talked about what are the basic control measures for surfaces and special measures especially some of the diseases which are very relevant to our dental practice like hepatitis hiv tuberculosis sars influenza etc then we had a second session uh, on 30th may where we talked a little bit about germicides sterilants and uh, how do we choose a surface disinfectant what is the process of disinfection and what is the role of sanitization important before disinfection to be carried out 
decontamination of the water lines, hand washing, and a little bit about uh, PPE, and also talked about uh, the N95 masks and PAPR devices, that is positive air pressure respirator devices. So I think uh, in this session, we will probably uh, take it further, talk about much more about protective gear, protective uh, equipment, barriers, air circulation, hand hygiene. So that is uh, in the session C, so session three. So at this juncture, let me invite uh, Professor Raghu Patea to take, take it forward, please. Dr. Raghu Patea. Thank you, sir. So uh, did we finish the water lines last time or we get just the water lines? We only touched about, we just talked, okay, okay. talked a little bit about it, yeah. Okay, let's let's do this thing. Let's recap it again. Okay. Um, okay, can you see the new screen? Yes. Okay, okay, just a second. So, um, uh, you know, too, there were a few questions, very relevant questions uh, that uh, were sent to me. One was on mucormycosis. So, uh, you know, Fungi in the southwestern region of the United States, black mold, you know, is very common. We have, in fact, we have monsoons just like in Chikmagalur or Kurg happening in Dallas right now. I mean, every year we have the summer monsoons and the winter monsoons. We can't see 10 feet ahead of us when we are driving. We are driving on the highway at about 10 to 15 miles an hour, everybody. Okay. Uh, one of the things is for most of these fungi, including mucormycosis, you need humidity and you need warmth. Okay. Uh, a couple of months ago, one of my colleagues uh, from India, you know, uh, one of the lieutenant colonels, uh, she asked me, why is it that we are seeing so much of mucormycosis? Where can it be present? So, uh, number one, uh, one of my uh, juniors in my fellowship, uh, Dr. Uh, Nuella Porteus, and uh, one of my mentors, uh, Dr. Robert Cooley, they did a very nice study on dental unit water systems. Okay? And they were trying to identify something which looked like a fungus. Okay. And what they found was it was a fungus which is present in the air, I mean, in the water lines, in the dental unit water systems itself. Prior to that, uh, Dr. Judith Chin, who now is one of the you know, very well-known professors in pediatric dentistry at Nova Southeastern, she and her mentor, and who's also partly my mentor, uh, Dr. Chris Miller, you know, he's, uh, he's, a, he's a fantastic microbiologist. Of course, now he's retired. He's from Indiana University. They tested the air part. You know, you know we need air to run our high-speed hand pieces. And guess what they found? They found fungi. Pretty decent uh, or a heavy growth of fungi. Another thing uh, we can see is when we are using, you know, when people are hospitalized, okay, some need to be on ventilators or respirators, you know, and so on. They also have items or air tubes that do come into a person's mouth and goes down into the throat, you know, to pump the air and keep them alive. Now, I understand you cannot put in pure oxygen, of course, but... Um, you have to use a certain amount of ambient air. I'm sure there should be HEPA filters which filter the air in, uh, into our lungs. But what if they are infected as well? I mean, we have to be proactive in identifying. We have to find, you know, we have ICMR. I worked with ICMR from, you know, 1986, 85, when Usha Lutra was the head of ICMR. I was a barefoot epidemiologist, you know, going to 30 villages, I mean, 70 villages in, and actually checking on people, every single person in those 70 villages, right from five years of age till they died almost, I mean, um, for oral cancer. Same way, they should actually have microbiologists and epidemiologists looking into 
what is the source of mycomucosis? How is it affecting the people? Is it also a hospital infection? Or is it also found in the dental unit water systems and airlines? You know, it is ubiquitous. It is found everywhere. The only problem is when the organism meets a particular patient who is susceptible. And a susceptible person could have a lifelong disability. It's very difficult to treat a mold, you know, in your lungs. If they survive, they'll have residual problems. So what what the governmental agencies must do is identify and help clean. You know, uh, given the cases, none of the <clears throat> ICU people in the hospitals will have time to even look at anything. All they're doing is they're looking at the vitals, they're looking at the guy going down, <clears throat> they're trying to give them as much as oxygen. Uh, do they have the backup to maintain the equipment? Now, the dentists, you know, on the other hand, are we looking into our water lines? Are we looking into our air lines? You know, they are some of the things which are very, very difficult to uh, address, but they should be addressed. Okay, or they must be addressed. The other question I had was on disinfectants. See, I've been coming to India right after, you know, when I was doing my fellowship between 1993 and 1996 end, I did come I mean, I spoke to Dr. Katon, who's my, who was my mentor at that time. I came to New Delhi. I went to the WHO office. You know, I wanted to write, write a basic set of standards. I went there and I met the person out there. He was a gentleman from Burma. Oh, he said, we have everything. You know, they had a 12-page document on dental infection control or infection control recommendation. That thing was older than the 1993 document, which was published by the CDC. I wasn't trying to trans transfer, you know, American standards to India. I said, we have to develop it from ground up. We have to involve people from top to bottom. You know, what they said, what the lady's question was, <clears throat> is that none of the disinfectants she was using, you know, based out of Hyderabad, had a TB kill claim. You know, I would... Uh, you know, Dr. Varma and Dr. Kohli and everybody out there, in the IDA people, the you know the the implantology people, they always invite me, you know, to come over. You know, I stayed there at the meeting and I go through, I walk through each of the exhibits and I look at all the infection control items. It is lacking. I spoke with the biggest of the big uh, dealerships on materials for India dental materials. They did not have a decent disinfectant. And then I see some of my friends who are trying to get stuff from abroad. They're trying to get, uh, you know, uh, uh, what they're getting is the lowest level, as I said, the quaternary ammonia compounds. You know, what we should do is we have the capacity in India to actually produce hypochlorous acid, not, not that uh, one which is electrochemically generated on a tabletop, no. Those are low-grade devices. I'm talking of chemistry, uh, using chemistry to develop hypochlorous acid. You know, the, the hypochlorous acid, you know, as I tested it, it was called analyte in 2000, I mean, in 1997. Uh, we developed it through a very strong electrochemical reaction, which produced a very high level of hypochlorous acid. That is impossible to do it in each dental clinic or a hospital. But there are chemistry-based uh, methods, okay, which you can produce anywhere between 3,000 to 5,000 parts per million of hypochlorous acid, which will definitely kill all these fungi. You know, into the airlines, if there are airlines, you, have, you can aerosolize it, you know, to decontaminate through the air, uh, through the air tubings as well. So a lot of stuff has to be done. I mean, I'm not saying that they have done it in the U.S. No, they have not. They have identified it in the U.S., but it has not been an issue because there are no dead bodies floating, as they say. But in India, we do have a lot of people who are infected. You know, you can pick it up from a surface. You can pick it up from breathing in the air. You know, when the fungi, a fungi dry up on a surface, they aerosolize. You know, they let out their spores. And then we breathe them. We get them. 
So we have to use a high level, uh, a higher level of the intermediate level disinfectants. Okay, let me recap. Um, did I finish this one last time? So only up to the, uh, you know, the disinfectant. Mouth, only up to the mouse. The okay. dental treatment, water contamination, I think that is supposed to be starting today. Okay. So, uh, given... Can, can we try putting it on the full screen mode? Yes, yes, yes. I, I, I'm just trying to get that thing. Hold, hold on. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So, uh, you know, uh, let me give you a little bit of background. You know what you see out here? These are eight dental unit water systems. Okay, which we had actually designed. It simulates exactly the ADEC dental unit water system. It has got all the meters, the same pressurization. It has got all the BIMBA valves, you know, the solenoids. And what we also did was we asked, we, we actually begged one of the largest, uh, you know, manufacturing industries to share their automation software. You know, you've seen those ads where these uh, robots are actually welding uh, items, you know, a car while building a car. The same software, it's called RS Logics. We, we got a copy of that from legal copy of that, you know, and we started, you know, automating the use of the dental unit water system. We simulated general dentistry, dental hygiene, prosthodontics, periodontics, because each of these, they have different frequency of water usage and the quantity of water being used. We simulated that and we actually built real biofilms. We didn't take biofilms from a reactor where it was grown in two weeks. We actually spent years developing, you know, seeding these things, these lines with real biofilms from dental units. And I've tested over 30 different types of chemicals using this device. Okay. I mean, this is the only device which is there in the world. Okay. Ed Gamble, one of the, uh, you know, what do you call technicians, and I designed this thing along with, uh, you know, Dr. Shannon Mills put a little bit of uh, uh, his knowledge as well into it. Okay. So, you know, when you open the tap, for drinking water, when you open the tap, you have about 40 to 400 <laughs> colony forming units per milliliter. Okay. 40 to 400 colony forming units per milliliter is drinkable or portable water. The minute you introduce this into a dental unit water system, this is how the base box of the dental unit water system looks. Look at the number of tubings and everything. It goes through, through so many convoluted areas. In a general dental practice in 24 hours, the total cumulative usage of water, time, a time of usage of water is about two to two and a half hours per day. The rest of the time, it actually sits and stagnates in these little, little tubings. Within a span of four weeks, you can easily get a few hundred thousand microbes per milliliter. See, the drinking water standards is 500 colony forming units of microbes per milliliter is safe as long as there are no coliforms and, you know, like E. coli and other things, okay, or monocultures. But when it goes into the dental unit water system, we are putting that water that water, that contaminated water, hundreds of thousands of colony forming units of gram, predominantly gram negative rods into a patient's mouth. Okay. This is because biofilms develop inside the dental unit water lines and it exponentially grows. It's warm, it's nice, it grows. Okay. Now, how does how do the dental unit water, what are the contaminants? So I test water for the total dissolved solids. Total dissolved solids could be, you know, uh, dissolved uh, salts like the magnesium and, and so on. You know, salts, calcium, magnesium salts, which are found uh, to almost, you know, a thousand TDS in the southwestern part of the United States. They come and coat the lines, okay? 
Why are these things important? Salts in the dental unit water system can act as buffers when we use a low-grade antimicrobial to clean the biofilms. You know, biofilms, uh, you know, these are biofilms which can contaminate, right? The salts will actually buffer out, you know, things like uh, three to 10 parts per million of uh, chlorine from hypochlorous acid, I mean, hy hypochlorite or bleach. Okay? We have found nematodes in the dental unit water systems. When the gram negative rods, you know, most of the, uh, the microbes in the water lines are gram negative rods, over 90% of them. Okay? They are a variety, the heterotropes. Okay? When they die, they release bacterial endotoxins, a huge swath of it. This is how a biofilm looks in a laser, a scanning laser confocal micrograph. Of, and this is the same picture using a scanning electron micrograph. What we do is we dye the microbes, okay? It's based on you know, whether it's live or dead. The live ones are green in color, the dead ones are red in color. What are these little lines you see here? Those are all fungi or fungi. Okay. They're all gram-negative rods. Okay. So these salts, I did an experiment, you know, I distilled 450 gallons of municipal water in Dallas in a distiller. And this is the amount of salts I found. This amount of salt can negate any low-grade antimicrobial. How do biofilms form? They have initial colonizers, you know, just like how when America happened, you know, Columbus came, he came to those little islands uh, along the eastern coast of uh, uh, Americas. You know, they're the scouts who come and settle. Then there is con natural contamination by salts. Look at this. This is the inside of the little unit water line with salts coating. It's almost like pavementing. And then these little microbes actually use the salt as nutrients and they can survive for a long time. What is this long little line which you see here? That is fungi, fungi, okay. In a few weeks, this is how it looked like a tropical rainforest. These are gram-negative rods, fungi, cocci, you name it, it's there. And then you can see salts out here. It forms a thick, thick you know, a hundred microns thick slime. You know, in Canada, we call it pachi. You know, I don't know what we say in Hindi, we find it in the garden hoses, the green stuff, you know, slime. That is what it forms. And that is full of microbes. Okay. Here is formation of biofilm on a clean line. You can see clumps. You know, you can see free floating organisms of plankton, uh, planktonic organisms. You can see biofilms, which are kind of forming clumps. In a new unit, within the third week, you can see rods and you can see um, Popsi, you can see, you know, a few little different organisms. Within week eight, look how how it, it how it has um, formed. You can see a whole bunch of green, a whole bunch of red. Within week ten, you can see these huge clumps forming. Now here, by week twenty six, I can see fungi, I can see cocci, I can see spirular organisms. And this is actually a picture from a, an older unit, which is over ten years of age. And this is how it looks. Salts, biofilms layer, salt layer, biofilm layer, one on top of the other. It looks like a coral reef in a National Geographic magazine. Okay. So this is what you can actually see in a dental unit water system. Okay. Now, are these microbes dangerous? A lot of people say, oh, they are common, uh, common salts. They, they can stay. Uh, you know, on your skin, they can be in your throat and all, and they can sy live symbiotically with humans. Yes, in smaller doses. The non-pathogenic or not so pathogenic organisms in such huge doses will disrupt the balance. Okay? It will disrupt the balance. What, what are the organisms we in our group have identified? We've identified Pseudomonas. Aerogenosa. It can cause super infections or hospital infections. Mycobacterium. It can cause lung infections. Okay. 
It can cause skin infections. It can cause uh, site infections of surgical sites. There were two very large cases, one on the West Coast, one on the East Coast, where close to you know, 70 children who had undergone uh, surgery had to be admitted to the hospital, ICU, because of mycobacterium site infections. Then you have Legionella. Legionella is a very funny device, I mean, uh, organism. It can cause two types or two clinical scenarios. One is called Legionella, uh, type of a pneumonia. It, it, sim, uh, it simulates almost like a flu-like symptom. Okay. Then the other clinical uh, outcome could be Pontiac fever, which is a gut or elementary canal infection. So for example, if I pick up Legionella, pneumophila, I go to my doctor, and I say, Doc, I'm feeling tired. I don't know what the what I've been infected with, a virus or a bacterium or anything. The doctor will look at me and he'll say, Raghu, you have uh, flu-like symptoms. You know, why don't you take some vitamins, drink lots of fluids, eat well and take rest? My brother goes to a doctor and he says, Doc, I have my stomach is not feeling good. My elementary canal is not feeling good. I feel like going to the bathroom all the time. The doctor said, you could have you know, a flu-like symptom, which, is, which affects the elementary canal too. They ask us both to go home, you know, eat food and you know, so on and so forth, eat curds, it'll help you. But within three days, we are dead. And then what happens is our death certificate will say that both of them died because of flu. They're all 60 years plus of age and they got a very bad uh, bout of flu and they died. To identify Legionella, you have to have molecular probes. A general medical practitioner will not be able to identify it. You have to go to a tertiary medical center with an active, very active, and very knowledgeable microbiology division that has molecular probes. Only with those probes can you detect Legionella. Okay, where do where does Legionella reside? It resides exactly where you know the fun, fungi reside. It needs humidity. It needs a lot of warmth. Okay. You can find it in the heat exchanges of air conditioning systems for centralized buildings. You can find it in the shower heads. You can find it in dental unit water systems. Then we found Moraxella. It's also called Oligella urolytica. Okay. It's basically a soil organism, you know, which can come into the dental unit water system if there's a break in the main line somewhere in the municipality. Water, uh, the, you know, the soil organisms can get into the system. And then it can go into your dental unit water system. Okay. It can cause bacterial endocarditis. Then you have fungi, fungal infections. Today, it could be mycomucrosis. Nobody has detected it. You know, you have to have an active epidemiological, microbiological in, uh, you know, investigation to look into it. And when people are dying, you know, the government should do something about it. You know, it's common knowledge. Now, <clears throat> do all these microbes affect healthy, active people? No, it doesn't. <clears throat> but dentists see in hospitals, sometimes we are called in to see a neutropenic patient. But they never come to a dental clinic. They are all hospitalized people, neutropenic. Now, in the clinic, we see people who have gone through radiotherapy, who have uncontrolled diabetes. You know, we see patients with certain cancers. We see patients who, have, uh, who are an active um, chemotherapy, where your immune system is, you know, battered down almost to the floor. We see patients with other chronic illnesses, and it could also be micronutrient deficiencies or nutritional deficiencies, which makes you susceptible to any of these organisms. Yeah. You know, in 1995, we approached the American Dental Association, the Centers for Disease Control, and so on. The Centers for Disease Control was active. You know, Mr. Walter Bond was very active in dental unit water systems. He was telling me what to do. You know, what are the things to look for? How do you plan your studies and so on? But before that, in 85, Pete Photos, you know, who's now an endodontist, of course, but he was in oral medicine at that time. He actually found that 20% of the students and employees in a dental setting showed higher IgG antibodies than people walking on the street. 
Ryan Taylor in 1988 did exactly the same thing. He showed about 50% of uh, dentists or dental healthcare workers had IgG compared to people work, walking on the street, which could be less than 1%. Oppenheim et al. They showed aerosols from dental units found to be the source of subclinical infection with Legionella pneumophila in a dental school. This school is not, none other than the dental school in Maryland. Okay. Atlas found that 68% of the dental unit water samples from 28 different dental clinics had Legionella. 61% of portable water from domestic or institutional faucets had at least one form of Legionella. Now, those are some of the studies which were done prior to my entry into infection control. You know, with the help of Paul Gelman Sciences, we got a grant from Paul Gelman Sciences into the university. You know, so Dr. Cedarberg and I, we actually studied, we flushed an old dental unit, which had never been cleaned in the past with bleach. Actually, not bleach, I mean, chlorine dioxide or bleach, one of those things. And what did we find? We found greater than 500 endotoxin units per milliliter. I mean, our columns, which we had set up, was up to 500. It could have been 800. It could have been more than that. You know, drinking water should have less than 10 to 20 endotoxin units per milliliter, but 500 endotoxins. You know, if you take that little bit, a, a, a one milliliter of those endotoxins and inject it into a big horse, very next day, you'll probably find either the horse suffering with fever or it could be dead. Okay. So those are bacterial disinfection byproducts you can get. Another thing is we also looked at bleach. Bleach is the cheapest thing to control biofilms. Yes, we use bleach in uh, uh, endodontics, but we use it very differently and safely out there. In a dental unit water system, you've got to flush, you know, at least 5,000 parts per million of bleach periodically or regularly to get rid of these biofilms. Now, when bleach comes in contact with biofilms, it produces disinfection byproducts called trihalomethanes. We found greater than 8,000 parts per million, a billion, I'm sorry, of trihalomethanes. While the Environmental Protection Agency said the maximum amount of, you know, trihalomethanes you can actually, uh, disinfection byproducts you can actually let into the wastewater systems is only 80 parts per billion. So bleach is not a good thing to clean biofilms because these trihalomethanes can cause cancers. It is listed in the IARC monographs. It is listed in the National Toxicology Programs of the United States. Okay. So... How do we clean the lines? How do we get rid of the biofilms? See, whenever you want to decontaminate the dental unit water system, you have to have a two-pronged approach. One is to flush out or shock and remove the biofilms, thorough cleaning, get rid of the organic matter, which is there. The other one is when you're using water, after you clean the biofilms out, you got to use water with a low-grade antimicrobial. If you don't remove the biofilms, your low-grade antimicrobials will get negated by the salts, the, you know, by so much, the organic matter, the salts. Oh, it'll just use the, the disinfectant as food sometimes. Okay. What we can do for our dental unit water systems for India is, number one, you disconnect it from the municipal water. Don't use municipal water directly into your dental unit water systems. Have a bottle system self-contained reservoir, okay? Use good, clean, low TDS water. TDS is total dissolved solids. It should be less than 10. Drinking water could have up to 200 uh, TDS, okay? But for introducing it into the dental unit water system, use low TDS water. You can buy it, uh, I mean, you can buy a filter, a tabletop filter or a distiller which is available in most countries, okay? And you can distill your water and use that water. 
you can use hypochlorous acid anywhere. I'm sorry, it's not 500 parts per million. You can use anywhere between 3,000 to 5,000 parts per million, the full strength. Introduce it into your lines, leave it for about five to 10 minutes and flush it out with clean water so that no residual uh, you know, disinfectant is there. Hypochlorous acid is not very dangerous to humans. In fact, our body produces hypochlorous acid when we are, you know, the monocytes and the neutrophils and all those things. When they are trying to kill the microbes, they produce a low grade of hypochlorous acid. Now, hypochlorous acid is not as corrosive as bleach. Its pH is around six, you know. So those are some things which you can use. Next one. So, Raghu, can yes, you, sir. Can you, uh, you know, this uh, this is a very important information that how do we ensure, uh, uh, you know, ensure uh, the the water lines are regularly cleaned and can you come up again? Right. Can you tell me, uh, you know, I think uh, that's yes, usually... yeah, no, no, we, 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 I mean, I'm going through that because that will come after what we use to clean it. You know, what we can do to clean it now. There are many tabletop, you know, what you call uh, hypochlorous acid activation uh, devices, you know, but they produce only up to 200 parts per million. 200 parts per million may not be sufficient to clean out the biofilms. So a chemically generated one, this one produces uh, 3,000 parts per million. This one produces 5,000 parts per million. Okay, These are chemical tablets. Those are inexpensive if they are manufactured in India. You know, you got to talk to the chemical companies. Here, uh, these things cost about, you know, what do you call, each tablet costs about three or four dollars. This one uh, costs about fifteen dollars per, I mean, per uh, bottle. Actually, when you, but with that you can disinfect at least four or five chairs, so the cost comes down. You know, so I would actually bank on hypochlorous acid because it can be manufactured chemically. You know, there are no patents left on it, okay? They're all expired because these things were developed quite a few years ago. Now, do not use a bleach. You know, bleach can actually ruin your dental unit water system, okay? Now, for an irrigant, you can go up to 10 parts per million of hypochlorous acid in very low TDS water and use it as an irrigant, you know? For your hand pieces, your air waters, or three-way syringe, or your ultrasonic scalers, and all the good stuff. Okay, it will not affect the patient. It does control microbes at that level of 10, 10 parts per million. It is a very good bacteriostatic agent. Okay, the next thing <coughs> is biological monitoring. How do we ensure that dental unit water systems are clean? After cleaning the lines at least four or five times, you can use R2A agar. It is called a low nutrient agar. You can take a water sample in a sterile container and ship it out to a lab. They can do that, but that is expensive. The other one is made by Millipore. You know, this one costs about five to seven dollars per test. Okay. There are many people who have come up with, you know, what you call optical. Uh, imaging and uh, so on and so forth, chemical way of uh, identifying microbes, but they are not accurate. The accuracy is this one, the R2A agar, but it's too expensive. Okay. Instead, you can use the, you know, in office test kit. It's called uh, HPC sampler made by Millipore. And that will show you, and there is a grid you can compare it to, and that will show you how contaminated your lines are. Okay. Now, this is a gold standard. This is not a gold standard. This is half as accurate as the agar, but you can, at that low grade level, you can multiply it by a factor of two and see if it is greater than 500 parts per million or less than 500 parts per million. Now, a lot of people, you know, one of uh, the investigators in our group, you know, he did a study and he said, oh, if you use the low-grade antimicrobials, it'll affect the composite bonding to 
dented in enamel. You know, Dr. Griggs and I, you know, we did. Griggs is probably the best uh, material scientist in the United States. He was my colleague at Baylor, I mean, at Texas A&M at that time. He and I did this study. And we published this in, you know, in a local paper in a uh, local journal, Kurg Institute of Dental Sciences in, in India. But they have a journal. We use bioclears, closes, tap water, electrochemically activated water, and dentopure of the iodine. We found, we did a double-blinded study. We found no problems. In fact, some of them increased the bond strength. So any questions on this so far? You know, so here is uh, the next chapter, which is instrument reprocessing. Instrument reprocessing for instruments re which we reuse inside the patient's mouth must be sterilized if it can withstand sterilization. Heat sterilization is better than chemical immersion. Yeah. Okay, as I told you in the past, Critical and semi-critical surfaces must be sterilized or they must be single-use disposable. Most of the stuff we use are reusable, the sharp instruments and so on. The most common method of sterilization we use worldwide is steam sterilization or autoclaving. Okay. This thing has been misunderstood and pushed by dental industry. Remember, I spent at least four years with Amy. Amy is the Association for the Advancement of Medical Instrumentation. Okay? And they dictate how to recycle your instruments to the FDA, Food and Drug Administration, to the CDC, and to the manufacturers. Okay? And we'll talk a little bit about that. Basic rules, always clean instruments before sterilization. Okay, number one, if you don't have an ultrasonic cleaner, you know, instrument cleaner, you have to hand scrub the instruments. Use a long handled brush to clean your instruments thoroughly. After cleaning and rinsing, you have to inspect them. The next thing is sterilization is required for critical and semi-critical items. Only disinfect equipment which cannot be sterilized. There are very few you know, in dentistry that cannot be heat sterilized. Heat and heat plus chemical methods are superior to chemical immersion methods, like in, you know, when we say immersion, it can be glutaraldehyde or Cydex or Cydex OPA or one of those kinds of things with 3.4% glutaraldehyde. Okay. <clears throat> Weekly sterilization monitoring. Okay, that is the requirement in the United States. Test ultrasonic machine on a monthly basis. Now, as soon as we treat a patient, we separate the instruments from the waste. The regulated waste, such as disposable sharps, if you're using a disposable burr, disposable scalpel, you know, you dispose those tips into a sharps container. The soft saturated waste, like cotton rolls, gauze, which is saturated, not doesn't not a tinge of, of uh, liquid, but if you squeeze that and you can exude a drop of it, of that liquid, that must go into a regulated waste bag, which is normally red in color. And they have to be removed by an agency which will come and pick it up from your office or you can mail it out to them and they will get rid of it in a safe manner. Okay? Now, the rest of the uh, waste, which is tinged with blood or saliva, that you can throw it into the regular trash. You don't need to recycle it. The instruments, we take it out, we separate the hand pieces. We have to recirculate the hand pieces or you know, clean those hand pieces using the manufacturer's recommended instructions. You know. Uh, there are devices which do that. They actually clean the thing and they also lubricate it. The rest of the instruments can be put into an ultrasonic machine and sonicate it for, if they are loose instruments, you sonicate them for at least 10 minutes. If they are in cassettes, you sonicate them for 15 to 20 minutes. Okay. 
once it's done you take those instruments out you rinse them and then you dump them onto a white towel okay and inspect each instrument to see if there's any other contaminants there like you know in scalers we normally find tissue tags of the previous patient we have to take those instruments out and separately clean them by hand okay with a long handled brush and put them back into the set pat dry them and put them into a sterilization pouch that is a very important step which we don't follow in india you know we use this ultrasonic <clears throat> no i'm i'm sorry um, ultraviolet ray kind of uh, boxes where you can keep your instruments open no that is not a way of preserving a sterile instrument if it is not put into a pouch or into a wrap or into a cassette and then wrapped and sterilized you cannot maintain the sterility okay the ultraviolet ray uh, light and all those things they are useless they have not been found there are no evidence based studies which have shown regularly that those instruments when you drop them into a broth will not show a growth of microbes they are not sterile they may be clean but they are not sterile they are kitchen clean like a spoon you know in a kitchen can you take a kitchen knife and do surgery no you cannot even if you keep it under ultraviolet uh, light you will not be allowed to do surgery with that okay they have to be in a pouch or in a wrap okay, to maintain sterility Uh, so for Raghu, yes sir yes sir we, we have a query here that yes. uh, whether, you know because there's a big question here is that how do we ensure that the water lines are clean you know because we tend to uh, over liquid sometimes so there is a question here that whether the hypochlorous uh, chlorous tablets which you said that if if yes. you know if we put it in the main water jar will that help yes it will <clears throat> yes it will you know if you take a full strength hypochlorous acid like the 3000 parts per million or 5000 parts per million tablet put it into your jar which is attached to your dental unit water system of the bottle yeah okay and you load the lines and leave it for 5 to 10 minutes repeat that at least about four times on the first day and then once weekly for the next you know four to six weeks and after which you can do it once a month it will get rid of the biofilms it will drop the biofilms and you have to use a low grade uh, solution of up to 10 parts per million of the hypochlorous acid have, okay. have you know have have the manufacturer ever looked into a material for the water lines uh, yes sir in, with which they build so that it can retard uh you know biofilm formation or any such yes sir. yes sir, they have in fact i have tested okay. silver impregnated <clears throat> you know plastics hmm. okay i'll give you an example they don't work hmm. silver or microban or all these things they will not work you know why because hmm. the salts will coat the lines inside the water lines hmm. and it will polarize that particular antimicrobial and on top of the salt the biofilms grow so uh, yeah okay yeah Raghu, it's not it's not consistent at all i've tested it yes okay. yes sir Raghu, another question is that uh, you know like most uh, uh, high end uh, you know dental units have a system where you can flush it you know you can uh, disinfect it uh -huh. the water lines uh -huh. isn't it so but yes. it, you know uh, how about that the, at the end of the day if those water lines are are flushed you know with a vigorous uh, uh, vigorous water or something will that help also will they produce they will they uh, reduce the colony forming units uh, you know in the uh, water yes sir and no sir yes sir it will it will get rid of some of the free floating microorganisms like the planktonic organisms but it will not disrupt the biofilms we've done those studies too see i have been funded by the government here and by dental industry through the university for over 25 years in studying water lines you know i've had five nih grants i've had close to 30 industry grants for developmental studies because i was the only one who had a lab water line lab with with assistance 
helping me run it all the time at multiple uh, we did multiple studies on the same run on different disinfectants okay okay we've done Thank studies com comparing you know even the growth of the microbes okay excuse me can we come in between yeah sure yes, sir come <clears> around <throat> Sir, my question is: There are two lines. What we are talking about, flushing, is what Dr. Mahesh Verma was talking about just now. Is the suction uh -huh. line? Is the suction, oh, the suction line? Lines, the... Yeah, suction lines is a different story. I'll I'll come to that as well. Okay, but as far as the uh, normal uh, water lines are concerned, if we have a container and we, on a regular basis, put uh, hypochlorous acid tablets on into them on a regular basis. Will it suffice, and will it be good for uh, us if we do it on a regular basis, on a daily basis, sir? A daily basis will be very difficult and very expensive. But if you mm -hmm. can do it on a daily basis, fantastic. See, uh, you know what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to provide a 16-hour course in a four-hour <laughs> time span. But I got I'll it. tell you one. <laughs> yeah, the the thing is, they have already done that. You know, Castellini Systems out of um, Italy. I was the consultant for the uh, Castellini for the University of Bologna and the Italian dental boards. And we tested their dental units. Their dental units have soft sockets where you can stick all your dental unit water lines in between patients and they flush it with a sterilant paracetic acid, you know, TAAD perborate. That's also one of the studies which I've published. <clears throat> and guess what? They use sterile water to treat the patients. Gamma irradiated sterile water. So they flush the lines between patients. And they also have buttons, like pneumatic buttons, which you press the button. You can take out the suction line totally and reprocess it with parasitic acid separately. And all those can be put into an autoclave and sterilized. Even their, their light handles, switches, everything. You press a button, the whole console comes out. Pneumatically, and you can put that into the autoclave. Yeah, uh, those chairs where uh, those dental units like Castellini Puma, Castellini Logos, all those, they were the highest end dental units available. They had everything. They even had a screen which had two leads, you know, just in case you're going into AFib, you know, you are attached it to your body, okay? A few minutes before you go into AFib, that screen goes blank and then your meter comes up. You know, the graph, it starts showing you what's happening. You have adequate time to call 911 or take remedial action. They were so advanced. Yes, but they used parasitic acid and they used sterile water. The reason why they did that in Italy and, and in, uh, you know, a neighboring country, which is that other one, Austria. Before you become a dentist, you get a medical degree. Dentistry is a specialty. They look at it from a very serious infection control standpoint because they already have an MD and they've gone through the whole nine yards of microbiology. Okay. The rest of the world, I mean, ADEC tried to imitate that thing. It never flew. In the, in the, even in America, this, oh, it's so, why should we pay so much for this device? Yeah, when you're making half a million dollars to a million dollars a year, why not? You know, I mean, that's my thoughts on that. But by and large, if you can use hypochlorous acid at the end of the day or once a week, if you can flush it with the full strength, you can remove the biofilms and the, you know, it can remove all the contaminants. And yet it can be cheap if you can do it. And I would love if you can do it at least once a week. You can do it once a month. I'll still fall at your feet, you know. Uh, biofilms are very difficult to control. So, but you can do it. So anyway, coming back to um, uh, sterilization, let's talk a little bit about ultrasonic machine. You know, every clinic in India must have an ultrasonic machine. Come on, this is the basic thing. Uh, you know, I know friends who have excellent clinics all the way down to an okay clinic I'm still in India. I still come to India. I do, uh, you know, I'm still licensed in India, I'm sure. Yeah. What I'm saying is ultrasonic machine is a thousand times better, at least, than cleaning the instruments with your hands. It's a capital investment. You know, it costs a few thousand rupees. Yes, it does. 
try to use a good non-ionic detergent or uh, enzymatic cleaner in your ultrasonic bath. You have to take care of this bath, just like how you take care of your kitchen utensils every day. At the end of the day, you need to drain the bath out, wipe it clean, keep it dry, disinfect it with a you know, regular surface disinfectant. The next morning, you fill the thing with water, clean water, okay? Low TDS water again, or distilled water. Bring it up uh, to the level which they say, uh, you know, where you should put. And then you add your, either your tablet, which is normally an enzymatic tablet, or a non-ionic, uh, uh, you know, ultrasonic solution into it. And then you have to degas the machine. You have to take this uh, knob and turn it to 20 minutes and let it run empty for 20 minutes to re remove the air bubbles, which are there in the ultrasonic machine. Because air bubbles hinder cavitation or implosion activities through which the ultrasonic machine works. After the degassing for 20 minutes, then it is ready for use. Okay, This has to be done every day. Once a month, take an aluminum foil. Okay, Start your machine, dip this foil all the way down to the bottom of your ultrasonic machine Okay, for about 10, 10 to 15 seconds and then pull it out. When you see this part is the non-immersed uh, foil. This part is the immersed foil. You see the pitting is uniform out here, right? That means your ultrasonic machine is working well. Suppose you have certain blank areas, just like here, you have it out here or here, you know, anywhere. That means your ultrasonic machine needs to be recalibrated, the transducers. If they are not recalibrated, then you're just putting it into a water bath with some solution, that's it. Okay? You got to do that once a month to make sure. Then you have instrument washers. Institutions can get instrument washers like Hydrum made by Saican. This is under the counter. This one is Mila, which is a fantastic machine, probably the best one. And it's a huger machine. They're quite expensive. They run about 10 to 14,000 US dollars here. But it's a good idea to have them in larger institutions. Okay. Let's not talk about dry heat. You know, Let's talk about uh, steam under pressure. Autoclaving. <clears throat> Autoclaving is, think of a pressure cooker. Basically, autoclaving came from the canning industry. The technology was translated from, you know, food canning, bottling industry in not the last century, in the early part of last century, of the 20th century, let's say. So there are two cycles which we use in uh, autoclaving. One is the slow cycle, which runs at 121 degrees at 15 PSI for 30 minutes. Okay. The next one is a fast cycle, which is 134 degrees at 30 PSI pressure for three to five minutes. Okay. That is the active sterilization time after the parameters of 121 degrees Celsius and 15 PSI or 134 degrees for 30 PSI has reached. Okay. So you have the warm-up time, you have the sterilization time. If it's a slow cycle, 30 minutes. If it's a fast cycle, five minutes. And then you have the drying time and the cool down time before you can handle the instruments. So they can take about 60 to 90 minutes per cycle. Now, you must package the instrument before you put it in. It should be in a sterilization pouch or it, it should be in <clears throat> a wrap you know, the sterilization wrap. These, these materials, the packaging materials have been available in India since, you know, I've seen it, you know, with what's that company uh, based out of Bangalore? Uh, which is Confidential. They had, they had the ones where you could actually insert your instruments, seal it with a heat sealer, and that can go into an order clip. And that can be preserved for as long as the seal is not broken. There is no time span on that. You don't need to put a time and date for that. Okay. Now, <clears throat> another thing which is misunderstood by most of the agencies that clear devices. You know, I told you copycat, copycat. Don't be a copycat. I've seen this in India. I've seen this in Europe. I've seen this in uh, Eastern Europe. 
I've seen this in Asia, other parts of Asia. I've seen this in the Middle East. There are three classifications of sterilizers. The N-class sterilizer is nothing but a modified pressure cooker, which can go up to you know, a slow cycle or a fast cycle. It displaces. What it does is it's got a chamber. The chamber starts heating up. A little amount of water falls in a given amount. To create steam, it pushes all the air out and the whole chamber is filled with steam. You remember during your pre-university days or your ISC days, you know, we studied about root mean squared velocity. We studied about thermodynamics. Yeah. You need pressure and you need temperature. They will both work in the same direction. There's, they help each other. They work in a synergistic activity. If there's no pressure, it will never reach 121 degrees. Water boils in New Delhi. It boils at 86 degrees. I've tested it. Okay. So, Gravity, it's our oldest method of sterilization, and it is a very valid method of sterilization. Okay, then came, you know, people in the industry and people in pharmaceuticals, they say, oh, we use a lot of devices that have capillaries in them. We have to actually suck out all the air and displace it with steam. Okay, fine. Then came the S-class, where they had one vacuum removal and then steam was introduced. Then it reaches the ambient temperature and pressure and then goes through a cycle and then comes through a drying cycle and a cool down cycle. And then came another group of people who said, oh, if there is, uh, if steam is introduced into these little capillary items, then how do you displace that steam out? It will form beads of water when it cools down. So they wanted a pre-vac and a post-vac. After the sterilization cycle, and this is what is required by most countries. Okay. For dentistry, an N-class sterilizer, if you have an N-class sterilizer and it is working well, and it's got a readout, and if it's got a printout, you know, if you can attach it to a printer or save the sterilization data, that itself is fantastic. I have not come across one single case of death or disability or an infection if it has gone through an incomplete cycle, unbroken cycle of an N-class sterilizer. N-class sterilizer is very robust. It has very less moving parts. The only moving, only part which you need to replace is the seal very often, just like a pressure cooker's ring, O-ring, same thing, okay? Now, <clears throat> let's talk about sterilization monitoring. So what I want, uh, India to do, I want other countries to do, is go back and look at the N-class sterilizer. N-class sterilizer is one-third the cost of a B-class sterilizer. Yet it works. Most people don't know the cycle times. You know, I was in New Delhi a few years ago. I went to some of the greatest institutions, federal government institutions included. What I found out that most of the people didn't know what a slow cycle and a fast cycle was. They just the you know, person who was doing it just pressed a button and all these things were cleared. When I tested them with a digital device, I found four out of five of the sterilizers which were cleared with that green strip, you know, when they come and inspect it periodically, they failed. Anyway, the best method to test a sterilizer according to the United States uh, States Boards of Dental Examiners, the Centers for Disease Control and so on, is using geobacillus subtilis spores at least once a week, they say. I don't want it to be used once a week. I want something which is immediate, which tells me that instruments are sterilized. Okay, it can be a digital output, it can be a printout from the sterilizer or somebody who's watched and made sure that the sterilizer is not blinking you know, when they take the instruments out, that means it's not working, okay? For every cycle. Spores are good once a week to test it out. But if you get a failure, you have to inform patients two weeks prior to the failure and let them know, please come for an HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C blood test to see if you have picked up any of these 
blood-borne diseases from my clinic. Will anybody do that? Nobody does that in America, although that is the rule. Nobody does that in Europe. Nobody does that in India. Okay? So what you need is immediate proof that you can release the instruments into a patient's mouth okay, for treatment. So let's talk about the different types of monitoring and validation in office or by mailing it out to uh, a sterilization monitoring system. Okay. The spore strips which we get, which we mail out you know, to the lab, the monitoring lab, they have B, I mean, uh, geobacillus stereothermophilus. Since it takes about a week to get the results, mailing it out to them and they will grow it for three days and then they will report back to you. It takes about five to six working days or a week, let's say. Whereas you have in-office monitoring systems, which will give you results within three hours to 24 hours, at least the screening tests. And these are actually geobacillus subtilis uh, vials. This is a control, you don't put that into the sterilizer. This one, you already put it, it'll all be purple. The minute you put it into a sterilizer, it goes through a cycle, it turns yellow. That means it is, it is a pass in sterilization. Let's talk about different indicators, which you can use. Class one is a process indicator, okay? It's that you know strip which you put in, it'll give you the zebra kind of a thing if it's exposed to heat. Class two is a buoy dick test. Now. Since all the governments in different countries want everybody to use a B-class sterilizer, if you want to use a B-class sterilizer, you must test it every day for air removal. And that is done with a buoy dig test. It costs $8 per day to test the sterilizer before it is used for sterilizing instruments. Okay, Nobody does that. In America too. Then don't worry about class three, that's for dry heat. Class four is, it's a blue spot which turns black if it goes through a sterilization cycle. Class five are integrating indicators where it's got a waxy pouch where the line goes all the way to the pass. And that shows it's gone through a good sterilization cycle. Emulators are made by manufacturers for a particular sterilizer which they manufacture for a particular cycle, be it a slow cycle, you have a slow emulating indicator or emulator. For a fast cycle, you have an emulator. So here's an example. This is a class one, okay? Before sterilization, it was like this. After sterilization, it's like this. You don't have to sterilize it. Before you actually, if you expose it to any heat, it turns black. Then on the sterilization pouches, you have this pink dot which turns into a chocolate colored dot. These are class one. They just give you an idea. Now, this is a test pack which you have to run for a B-class sterilizer every day. Okay? If you're going to follow a particular technology, you've got to follow testing the technology too. There's no point in bringing that in and saying, yeah, we have a B-class. No, you have to test it every day. Before sterilization, after sterilization. This sheet is stacked in the middle of a set of index card-like uh, paper. There'll be about 20 on the top, 20 at the bottom, and it's put into a test pack like this, and then it's introduced into a sterilizer to test the vacuum removal. If there's complete vacuum removal, if there's, oh, I'm sorry. If there's complete vacuum removal, it'll look like this. Nobody does that. Then let's talk about class four. It's a blue dot which turns black. Okay. And then this one is a class five. It's got a small little container area which has got a waxy pellet. And the waxy pellet, when it meets steam and heat for a given time, goes from fail to pass. This is fail, this is pass, this is unused. It has to be used in every cycle. That's what the chemical people say. And these are the emulators for cycan, you know, for a particular cycle, 
and things like that. Now, I'll give you an example of what we did. I worked with a company called Maxim Integrated. I'm on two patents of the three patents they have on this digital indicator. It's called DS1922F. We developed this, we tested it. It goes into a cradle and the cradle is attached to your computer. You can choose whichever cycle for whichever sterilizer. It takes about 10 seconds because it's all pre-programmed. Okay, there's a software which goes with the computer. Once that is primed, you put this into the order clip. We even published the study, you know. We put it into an order clip separately, just this, this little digital indicator. We run it for the cycle. Okay, we did a whole bunch of studies on that, you know, thousands and thousands of tests. It took us four years of pure testing on the bench top. Once it comes out of the sterilizer, you attach it back to your computer. Within seconds, it will give you this particular screen. It shows a pass if it's gone through the whole thing. It shows a fail, a red X, if it has failed. It saves all the data in a PDF format. It even saves it in a CSV uh, file as well. It gives you a graph. Okay. I compared the studies. Uh, I did a pretty long study. You know, this is for field purposes where you cannot take an autoclave, but you can take a, uh, a huge uh, pressure pot or a pressure cooker, which has got a, uh, you know, what do you call a, a dial out here, which shows what the pressure is and so on. I tested the in office, the steam indicator, the class one, class four, class five, and the spores. These two are spores. For 30 cycles, at zero time exposure, one minute, two minute, three minute, four minute, all the way to 30 minutes for the slow cycle. Guess what I found? The class one indicator, before it reaches 100 degrees Celsius, it shows a pass. A class four indicator, you remember that blue dot, which becomes black? Right after it reaches 121 degrees, within two to three minutes, it shows a pass. The class five, you know, that waxy pellet going from fail to pass, that by about the sixth minute, the biologic indicators, be it the vial or the spore strip, before it even reaches half the cycle, not even 15 minutes, by the seventh minute, it shows a pass. The digital indicator, you know, the one which we put in, the, you know, the electronic device, that only shows a pass after 99% of the cycle. Okay. So I was talking to some of the, uh, you know, dental people, you know, at large clinics and so on and hospitals in India. Oh, we all do, you know, we all send our things to on a weekly basis to the lab. Now, oh, come on. If the digital indicators can measure up to 99%, but the biologic indicator, which is the gold standard, only measures less than half the complete cycle. What are we using it for? I will tell you guys, you know, who have an order claim in your office. Take the biologic indicator, mark it at, run the slow cycle, 25 minutes, 20 minutes. You know, do the 30 minute, 25 minute, 20 minute, 15 minute, 10 minute, five minute, and zero minute as a control. Run it like that and then send it off to the lab. What I'll tell you is it will show a pass before 15 minutes. That means half your 30 minute cycle. Okay. So that is the end of today's talk. Please let me know if you have any questions. And I see you know, four chat items. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, okay, yeah. Somebody's so there's one called Calbenium solution. Calbenium solution is useless. We tested that too. Okay. We found in the Calbenium solution, we found the growth of fungi. This was done at the Air Force Labs, Brooks Air Force Labs in 1995, 1996. Yes. So don't use that. Belzalcolium chloride, EDTA. Yeah. All those things are not going to work. Calbenium is not good. It itself showed growth of fungi. 
Is the electronic calculator available now? No. None of the industry or the entities want to pick it up because you know what happened? You know, the chemical uh, indicator industry makes hundreds and thousands of millions of dollars selling those chemical indicators. Okay, and biologic indicators, which are useless in my opinion. Okay. The electronic device is available through Maxim Integrated. You'll have to get a contract with them. They manufacture semiconductors, basically. All they do is they manufacture. If you guys can, somebody wants to contact them and go to them and say, hey, we want to use it for India. We want to use it for Arabia. This data of every single cycle can be uploaded into the cloud also for somebody to monitor it. Yeah, it's available, but somebody with big pockets has to come, like, you know, hospital, work hard or whatever, Fortis or the Indian government. They can actually contact Maxim Integrated and talk to them. If you want to, let me know and I'll introduce you to the biggest guy out there. You know, so, yes. So, uh, Raghu. Yes, sir. Uh, I think you had a we, we uh, I think today's uh, presentation was quite interesting and quite uh, useful and also uh, in fact a little bit of uh, sensitization to our profession colleagues that how we can uh, be concerned about the ubiquitous what you said the nature right. of uh, uh, the you know fungus and micro microbes and the biofilms in fact you know. Right. Uh, which is usually found in a water lines. And, uh, you know, we need disinfectants, uh, you know, and we need a higher level of disinfectant. In fact, you said Correct. we need an intermittent, intermittent uh, tertiary ammonium compounds. And, uh, and the biofilms are so dangerous that they grow exponentially. So if you don't clean them, it can cause havoc and... Uh, See, because these what biofilms have a lot of things. They have sores, they have bacteria, fun, fungi, they have nematodes, they have endotoxin of the dead and the uh, living, uh, you know, my, uh, microbes. So, uh, you know, and the, you know, how these uh, fungi and microbes, they sustain because they use those salts to thrive, you know, to sustain. And uh, we have uh, many dangerous kinds of microbes in these water lines, including Pseudomonas, Mycobacterium, Legionella, Moxella, and uh, Moxella, and Fungi. And they can be dangerous, as dangerous as they can even cause endocarditis. So in the usually, what we use is a bleach, but bleach is very dangerous. I think this is uh, important information that we normally tend to use bleach, and bleach is cheap, but it is dangerous because it, it uh, Produces trihalomethanes and which are which can cause cancer, which can be very uh, uh, you know uh, this thing very dangerous on the long run. Yeah, and so what we need we need a two pronged approach for uh, cleaning the water lines: flush, shock it for five to ten minutes, you know, and then uh, uh, you you know we uh, uh, we must ensure that the water lines are clean. And uh, how do we? Uh, ensure that these are clean. Of course, we have to get, uh, we must uh, get certain, uh, uh, you know, uh, certain uh, tests done, which is usually not, not done. And you also talked about a little bit of instrument reprocessing, how, what is the normal way, but something which is most important in instrument cleaning and uh, sterilization is the ultrasonic scalar. You know, every- The, every, the every, ultrasonic uh, cleaner, cleaner. Ultrasonic cleaner, cleaner. cleaner. You know, I want to have a question here that in India, we get a lot of these cheap variety of Chinese ultrasonic cleaners. It just costs about 2000 bucks or so. Uh, have you ever tested them? How effective and how good these are? Because they have a sound yeah, of ultrasonic, but I don't know whether they really bring about the ultrasonic. So, so what uh, I've seen, there are two levels I've noticed. You know, jewelers, if you go to any of the jewelers, yeah, yeah. let's say, <laughs> Yeah. They have the low-grade ultrasonic machine. Yeah. Okay. In, in that, even if you put an HMT watch or a Titan watch, it'll clean it. 
Okay, yeah. but it will not damage the watch because the seals in those are pretty good. It's also good. for jewelry. It's also for jewelry. Ladies have jewelry. it at home. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Now, for the medical purposes, it is a lot more powerful. It is at least twenty times more powerful. Mm. Okay. Now, I don't understand. See, you know, twenty years ago, I saw with what is that? That confident fellow. You know, that person. They they manufacture the ultrasonics. They manufacture the autoclaves. and those things are manufactured with the same power as what we use in the us or in europe or anywhere else mm. people were still going in for chinese yeah. you know i can understand if they go to uh, uh, you know go get cavos uh, or you know there are standard machines or a japanese machine cold team cold team cold team that is a good one yes that's a yes, good one that is a good one the best one which i tested was health sonics of course Health Sonics got bought out by Patterson and all those people, but the medical grade ultrasonic machines are not really that expensive, and it will cost probably about ten thousand or you know twelve thousand dollars, depending on the uh, I mean, rupees. I'm sorry, uh, for a medical grade small one, for a larger one it will be you know multiplied by whatever the size is. It's mm -hmm. available in India, but nobody nobody was interested in doing that. They got one untrained person to come and clean the the items and then all that person did was clean the thing and put it into an autoclave if they had an autoclave or they put it into a boiler mm -hmm. you know i mean so mahesh that this is what uh, you know what you all are the cream of the crop not only for india for the world because you come out and lecture you people have seen the world where they are you know look at uh, computer sciences look at it who is running it in the world india right because they have a very different mindset what we should do you know is i implore you guys you know you are the leaders to actually work with the government come up with a decent set of guidelines which people can follow and every 5 years step it up a little more step it up a little more that's how we build it i mean you know you built a whole school an institution so you didn't happen overnight it took you 20 25 years but you built it that should be the attitude towards these devices too okay i think two, then, uh, two uh, very important uh, information which you gave us was a uh, when you using a detergent for in the ultrasonic cleaning uh, machines we use non ionic non ionic non ionic yes so uh, and also you said you talked about degassing we used to do degassing for furnaces you know like a porcelain Correct. furnaces yes. We used to degas because it can uh, bring about metal ceramic bond. It can affect. So we used to degas. Exactly. We, we call it purging. 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 Yes. Purging. Yeah. So Correct. yeah. So that that is very important information. But can you tell us about these non-ionic uh, solutions or detergents? Okay. Which are these? Okay. So there are there are uh, basically four types, common types that are used. One is non-ionic. That means it is it is not anionic or cationic then you have the uh, cationic and anionic solutions as well and then you have enzymatic solutions so what i found in a very large study we did you know uh, let me we found that non ionic solutions and some enzymatic solutions are very compatible with the instruments they do not cause pitting or corrosion sometimes people leave it in the ultrasonic machine and go home and come back the next day that's not a good idea you will have pitting of all the high carbon steel instruments and then they'll blame a solution so non ionic ones don't have a charge uh, they have a very little cations and anions but it's more neutral enzymatic solutions which now they come in tablets you put the tablet into the <coughs> given amount and then it becomes pretty good you know so those are some of the yeah good good oh, another thing i think uh, another piece of good information is that we everybody need not have a b type uh, autoclave which is everybody is trying to have <coughs> trying to get yeah a good n n class which is the oldest exactly type of can, can work as well isn't it yes i mean there are no evidence based studies to prove any outbreaks disease outbreaks or infections when an n class is used it is you know it is esoteric we you know dentists i'll tell you are have a mindset all dentists around the world 
we like gadgets. You know, we all like gadgets, right? Because we deal with a lot of gadgets. Mm -hmm. The minute somebody comes and tells us, oh, this uh, B class does this, 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 and this. And in the back of our mind, we'll always be thinking we should go for a B class. But B class tends to break down also. The pumps will break, the vacuum pumps will break down, the fins will break down, maintenance costs go up. You know, I'll give you an example. Uh, a Suzuki, a Maruti Suzuki car versus a Mercedes. Suzuki is affordable. It takes you from point A to point B. Okay. Mercedes does the same thing too. But when it comes to repairs, I think most Indians can afford a Suzuki. <laughs> <laughs> and it does its job, you know, so I, know. I still feel... But I think uh, it's a good uh, uh, upgradation that, uh, you know, most of our professionals now realize that every clinic should have autoclave and people yeah, have... Must. Every clinic is being equipped with the... Mahesh we, didn't, Mahesh, we didn't have this lecture before, otherwise we would have not gone in for a B class, we would have stuck to N class only. Yeah, N class, that's right. <laughs> and, uh, also, you know, the monitoring, you, uh, Raghu, you talked about monitoring, sterilization... Yeah, most of us only rely on the pouches because those are color coded and you know it gets changed. That's it. And we still are not using a very high end, uh, uh, you know, spores which you talked about, geobacillus, right. uh, thermophilus, and uh, other. Uh, you said types. Uh, five class are there. Uh, five types right. are there. So we just rely on a color change which is uh, provided to us by the these dealers. So, but anyway. Uh, I think, uh, as you said, that uh, nobody is doing it. Doing it. <laughs> no, no you know, Mahesh, see, that is, that is why, you know, like, I still feel that you are the powerful people for India who can set the standards. You know, I've always been there. You know, I've come. And, and you know what? I know that you left that room for me in your house. <laughs> but... You got to take the lead and make these things happen for for our it's people. You know? Raghu, it's happening. It changed. It changed uh, yeah. so much in the last couple of years. So thank you, Raghu, for our wonderful thank you. insights and wonderful information. And Mahesh. we have some speakers here. Sharad, you want to ask some Mahesh, questions? Mahesh. No, no, no. Uh, yes, Mahesh. sir. Bali, sir. Bali, sir. Uh, hello, 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 uh, Raghu. Hello, yes, Raghu. Sir. Nice, very yes, nice uh, lectures, all the three of uh, them by her. Now, what I, I suggest you that now these lectures are very well registered in our minds, I hope. Now, yes, this sir. is all very, very deep. Uh, you, you have studied very, very deeply and given us outcomes. Now, what I want, as you know, I'm very, very practical and implementable. Things, right. what we want from you is a checklist. Give us in the le next lecture where we can hang it in our clinics or wherever we want, so that right. we we have uh, we instruct our people. Like, uh, for example, sweepers, who uh, we call them uh, Safai Karuchari here. That Correct. what they Karuchari. have to. What is their obligation? Second, what is the obligation of our assistants or nurses? Third, Correct. what is our obligation? And lastly, how we should uh, um, say uh, to our patients to be neat and clean. Now, these are the checklists I want. We should okay. hang it there in our clinic very, very, and see every day we mark it well, this is done, this is done, this is done, every day. This is what I want, this in my mind, if you can do it in your sure, next sir. lecture. Sure, sure. I mean, sure, we, we, we can do that. And, and also at that time, I will talk a little bit about the checklists and the items, the safety. I mean, I have the checklist for here based on the rules for here, but we can discuss that and see what is applicable to India, how we can step it up over the next few years. You know, we have to plan it. It can't be just translated overnight, but okay. I can bring out the questions and then we'll see. I mean, I did this with also Lebanon, you know, with the uh, ICD Middle East. I gave the lectures and all the good stuff, but then at the end they said, what, where's the checklist? So we had to spend an extra day sitting down and working out. And then I said, I, this is the basic information I can give you and how you can implement it, you know, the best, you know, and slowly step it up, slowly start tightening the news. So it, it becomes much safer for both the employees and for the patients. We can do that. So I'll, I'll come up with a list. Uh, 
I'll try yes, and send I think, it to I think, what I'm saying is yeah. it has to be it has to be instructed to all the uh, dental schools in India as well as our, our private practices. So they, whatever is practical, Correct. we should do it. You know, Correct. otherwise Correct. Uh, there's no use otherwise, in my opinion. Correct. Okay. That's true, sir. Please, sure, sir. please do, do that. that. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. So anyone, anyone else has uh, uh, any other comments to uh, say or share? Sharad? No, fine. Uh, I really uh, took it. Uh, this was a very, very nice and a very informative uh, presentation. Rather, the other last two ones have been also there. I believe the intent to implement should be always there. Unless and until the intent to implement is there. And that should also start as a basically one of the most important thing is the curriculum should be there for the students also. They should understand right at the base at the grassroots level and then how to implement it. We have to take because I believe that there are a lot of practices also what he was saying that just put the instrument into the ultrasonic and run it for a short period of time and take it out or wash it out. That happens. It really happens. And uh, we ignore it, but, but we should not be ignoring and we should take it very seriously and implement it. Uh, thank sure, you sir. for we'll, a we'll wonderful, uh, I think that's a good comment that, uh, you know, basically all these sensitization should come about in dental institution at the time of uh, training. Education. Students. You know, I Education. somehow I feel that we give so much importance to the subject matter, to the specialities, but as I said, the lifeline of practice is infection control. And especially in this scenario in pandemic, you know, that is really shook us and uh, it has really, again, uh, you know, uh, re-jigged re our approach towards uh, infection control. So hopefully, uh, you know, I think uh, this will be a, a learning lesson. And I'm, I know that in the last couple of years, a scenario in India has changed a lot. People are so much yeah. aware about infection control. I have seen practices which used to adopt a holy dip, uh, you know, approach 20, 30 years back <laughs> has I come know. a long way. Now, most practices are equipped with the type B autoclaves and ultrasonic cleaners. They have a cycle. But I think the only thing that we must make it a, as a mandatory step and as suggested by Dr. Bali, that at the end of the lecture, Dr. Raghu, your, uh, you know, your uh, uh, program, your certificate course would be very uh, uh, useful, provided you give us a kind of a, a small, a short uh, a list. Yeah, you know, uh, like a, a do's, you know, like a guideline, not exactly. Like do's and, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, see, how do we do it? What do we do? You know, okay, you do this, you do this, you know, so that, uh, so that, um, uh, all, you know, it, it becomes everybody, it's like a ritual. It's like a Correct. everyday ritual that you have done Correct. this, you know, all those yeah. checklists, as the Dr. Right. Bali said, the checklist, checklist for right. a, you know, how, how do we do? Okay, as uh, you suggested that, okay, our main water reservoir, which is other than the suction line, we got to clean it once in a once in a month and what chemical we should be using it. Okay, for, <laughs> for uh, other water lines, for everyday uh, practice, how do we clean, you know, like we do it, how do we sure, take sure. out water, air from the compressor after the practice? How do we right. take, uh, take out water from the handpiece? How do we dry the hand pool? So this also becomes a protocol. It becomes like a to-do every day because most of these things are handled by our supporting staff. Our, staff. Uh, yes. You know, yeah. yes. So they yes. also need to be because we understand and sometimes we leave it to them. So there is a scope that sometimes they overlook at these things. Okay. Thank you. So Guru... Uh, see, I have a joke for you. And then there's one quick question, which I want to let you know. I always called Mahesh Gurudeva. That was my nickname for him. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, you know, the Rig Veda has been written, right? Yajur Veda, Sama Veda, all these. Now, our infection control Veda falls under Yajur Veda, right? <laughs> so we have to complete the Veda still. There's <laughs> one question where uh, Dr. Kumar Rajan has asked, what is the practical suggestion for water lines in the Indian scenario where many dental chairs do not have high-end facilities? Okay. Now, sir, I can talk microbiologically. I look at the microbe, be it in India or in America. If I find that I can kill a microbe with a certain uh, process, 
it has to apply in all scenarios because the microbe does not differentiate where it is. You know, I understand, you know, it is harder for us to kind of do it in India because we initially we have not been exposed. Now we've been exposed or sensitized. After sensitization comes a process of implementing it and doing it slowly, you know. And once it becomes a part and parcel, as we say, it becomes just like, oh, every morning, as soon as I get up, I brush my teeth and I have my breakfast or I do my puja and then I go to work. It becomes a routine. You know, it becomes a culture. So uh, there is no Indian scenario or American scenario which the microbes look at. The microbes just look at where they can infect, where they can multiply, where they can survive. Till we, in any part of the world, uh, implement a process to control them. We can never eradicate them. You know, COVID, we thought we eradicated COVID last year in India. It went off. No, it's back. They change. They are very, very nice in becoming, you know, survivors. And they attack us. Same way, you know, we have to develop proven protocols, irrespective of where it is done. We have to understand it, learn it, and implement it. So that is, so I think it, that is the last question yeah. I've had. Thank you, Raghu. So, yeah. So, but you didn't you. still come out with a solution that how do, can we do it in an Indian scenario? You know, some Indian scenarios detach every dental unit from the municipal water, attach it to a, a self contained system like a water bottle, yeah. you know, a solid water bottle, not the ones which we drink uh, Coca Cola with, but the regular water bottles, you know, which come made out of polyurethane. And then once you have that bottle, then you can introduce the chemicals into it. You can introduce hypochlorous acid, you can introduce parasitic acid or TAED perborate, and so many different things. You know, after these series of lectures, I think we need to form a group and, and literally spend time how we can start implementing each of these items in the checklist as Dr. Bali brought out and see that people are following it. You know, it's not NABH, it's not you or I who can go inspect a clinic. The clinic goes on 24 hours, 365 days a year. They only come in a spot and then they check and then they go. But for us, it is our culture that we actually, like, just like when we eat, when we go out, if there is a spot on a spoon, we'll actually ask them, get me a different spoon. That should be the culture for infection control too. It should be just ingrained in us and it takes time. You know, but but let us form a small group and see what we can do, not only for India. We can actually learn in America or in Europe or Australia from what we did in India because education is a two-way street. Uh, may I come you in, know? sir, please? Yes. Yes, Kumar. Yes, uh, the reason why I was asking this question, I'm Kumar Rajan, sir, and the reason yes, why sir. I was asking is because, as Dr. Sharad, sir, also said very clearly, if, for example, this lecture would have been done earlier, there was no need to buy a B class. But for example, having invested uh, Calbanium products as well as IGN system in 10 of my dental chairs, and today I'm being Correct. told, for example, by your good self, who's an authority, that it is of no use, then it kind of yes, creates, a, creates a, a sense of doubt in, in what to buy. And uh, what yes. to kind of, and, yes. and of course, when I say this, in, since the 10 years that I'm using IG and Calbanium, I have, not having, I have not been having any report of microbiological culture which has come out positive. So that's why so I was what, asking what this question as to what to do. Yeah, I don't know. I'm, 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 one question I have is, uh, I've tested it, I, you know, Calbanium. I have tested it. Uh, I, I have proof of that, even in the Air Force. You know, the universities in the Air Force, when we, have a, we had a mutual memorandum of understanding to use each other's labs. And none of these companies paid us any money. Even when we went out for lunch, we paid for our own lunch, they pay for their own lunch because we followed very strong federal standards. And we worked for the federal government on the grants, just like CSIR and so on. Now, in one of the samples we found of the calbenium concentrate itself, we found fungal growth. Okay, we can talk, I mean, Dr. Tom Plamondon, uh, he's retired from the Air Force now as a full colonel. He practices in Colorado someplace. We can tell you that. It, you know, when when I send you, let's say, for example, I send you chlorhexidine gluconate to be used in a patient. And for some reason, 
you run a biological test on the the stuff which I've sent you even before you use on a patient, and you find fungal growth, what would what is the step you could take? We did not want to deal with them because they refused to answer our questions. Yet we ran it. It was not strong enough to kill biofilms, let me tell you. At that time, the best ones were still the bleach, you know, sodium hypochlorite or chlorine dioxide. Chlorine dioxide at 30 to 100 parts per million was much, much more powerful in eliminating biofilms. But of course, the downside is corrosion. You got to watch out on those things. So over time, we've looked at ozone at more than 2%, you know, which stays stable in the water, which is, uh, and there are devices which we have worked on, which will probably only come out 20 years from now, or it'll stay in the innovations graveyard because nobody picked it up. So I'm not saying that you should not use calbenium. Go ahead, but please run, run, it on R2A agar, but you have to find out from them, from the calbenium manufacturer, how do you neutralize the calbenium before you plate it, okay? Like for bleach, we use a phosphate buffer. It buffers out the chlorine so that the growth is not hindered on a medium. Same way for calbenium, you have to find out. Same way for chlorhexidine or citric acid or whatever, or Hypochlorous acid also. Hypochlorous acid, you can use a phosphate buffered solution. You know, so for calbenium, also find out from them how to neutralize it and run it on R2A agar, and then come up with your statement. Because uh, without that, you know, I cannot say anything. But what I am telling you, what I found. Okay, and I, I understand people will come up with papers everywhere. Yeah, I saw that. I just pulled up, you know, the link. It was there on the British Dental Journal. I have that paper in my docket as well. I've seen that. But uh, I'm not saying calbenium is bad. But when they sent it to us, that is what we found. And when that happens, when I say it to some government, if they say that, oh, can we use calbenium? I have to tell them, I'm forced to tell them what I found. And when I say that, because it, is a, it becomes a public policy issue, which is not for a clinic, it becomes for a whole region. The government will then say, okay, we should use calbenium. But what if I start finding fungal infections in patients later? Then they will say, oh, he didn't tell us that he found fungi. See, I am stuck between a rock and a hard place. On one hand, I'm a public health dentist. I was the first infectious diseases fellow. I was a federal employee in India before I left India. I was a research officer dentist for ICMR. And I only worked for state institutions. And in America, there is no, uh, no way you cannot follow rules. You must follow every single rule. So, and on top of that, whatever I say tends to become policy in certain places. May not be in America because everybody who's got a blog can become a policy you know, advocate. But what I'm saying is when I find something, I have to let them know. When I, you know, when we go and do presentations at IADR, or uh, AADR or CADR or European ADRs. When we present our studies, we present the studies where we found a positive thing. And if we find something negative, we present those negative things too. Much against what an industry member uh, wants us to do. They don't want us to tell anything negative. But we, when we do a study, we have a contract, irrespective of what the outcome is, we're going to present this at a peer group meeting, boom. So uh, that is the standard I hold myself again, uh, up to, you know. Thank you. So. Thank you, Raghu. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, I, I think it was a good uh, information also that uh, uh, regarding, uh, you know, the newer materials and newer chemicals which are being used for water lines. And uh, as the Kumar said that calibinium, which is, uh, you know, which has a lot of other chemicals like EDTA, benzalkonium, sodium, chloride, and all those aspartame and allantoy and all those things. I'm sure, uh, you know, it can, you see, sometimes uh, these studies can always, but, uh, you know, as he's saying that it is working, of course, he, I don't know whether he has undertaken R2A agar uh, culture, but I think uh, otherwise, 
he's probably got it done uh, you know microbiologically he's tested he's evaluated and right uh, right 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 but but you have to neutralize that to neutralize galbanum is very difficult you have to talk to them ask them how do you neutralize it and then run a couple of things with the microbiology labs to see if there is growth or no growth okay and we then they can implement it for testing so the moral of the story is that we have to come up with something which is economical which is easily available exactly. which can yes. be which can be carried out by masses by everybody you know because sometime uh, some of these drugs uh, some of these uh, chemicals also are uh, quite unaffordable and not available also so we're looking for so so, and, uh, so mahesh mahesh yeah. before i uh, let me interrupt yeah you had a large university i'm sure you have a chemistry department in the university yeah, we right you have yes right talk to the head analytical chemist person mm-hmm. okay on hypochlorous acid you know look up uh, you know i'll send you the different types of formulations which are end products yeah you do send please send me i get it done yeah you know i mean what i'm saying is they can make it into a two part solution one is a base one is an activator you can mm-hmm. add that there are no patent restrictions on that and these are cheap i'm talking of less than 10 rupees per clinic per day, uh, per cleaning session yeah so you that's know, 10 rupees you can't even get a coffee you yeah. know it is that cheap that these chemicals but it is being sold at 15 dollars in the us per uh, set you know so uh, i'm sure you know you can do that and once you know and then there are governmental agencies that can help you as well like csir you can go for a grant and you can actually help mass produce those things for the 200000 plus dentists in the country nobody needs to make money from that you know why should a company make it yeah give it Uh, i mean once it's available if somebody takes it and manufactures it yeah of course they have to have the cost so they will charge but it is cheap you know it's as, as cheap as bleach if you look at it you know yeah, that's what that's, i think yeah, so thank you ragu so yeah. we had a thank good thank you so much Not and only- wish me a good drive i'm actually going on for a 600 mile drive now as soon as i'm done <laughs> oh i see okay so yeah. thank I'll you catch- for a wonderful session and also a post uh, session discussion uh stimulating discussion and a uh, lot of information so thank you very much we see you next week now at the same time 6 o'clock india yes, india sir. time 6 in the evening next sunday and uh, on behalf of the icd section 6 and icd head office uh, thank you very much uh, and uh, look forward to joining you next week and with the with the list checklist and with yeah. the checklist Def- definitely a check <laughs> next week will be the checklist part we'll talk about that <laughs> okay the yeah. session four okay the group all the best yeah. thank, thank you thank you thank you so session 1 episode 4 <laughs> yes sir